All right, good morning, church. Let's stand together. This is the day that the Lord has made, and He calls us to rejoice and to be glad in it. And if you're new to our church, welcome to our church. We just want to point you to Jesus. Let's sing this together. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you said Though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn when you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to me Great faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me family our God truly is a faithful God he's a God who would we don't just sing to this morning, but he actually hears us worshiping him today. So be reminded of that as we, as we remind our souls of who he is. So let's sing it together. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may
Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness today, Lord. Yes, Lord.
pray together. Father, we believe that to be true today. Huh. I'm humbled today, Lord, that we can actually call you the most high God, that we can actually say that you're the God from age to age. Though the earth may pass away, your word will always remain the same. I'm thankful we can say that your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. <laughs> I'm thankful we can say this morning, Lord, that you're faithful and that you're true. Ain't nobody like you, King Jesus. Ain't nobody like you, our Heavenly Father, and there's nobody like you, Holy Spirit. So thank you for being a triune God that we get to gather today to serve and to point each other to through song. And now, Lord, we're about to hear the preaching of your word, Lord. So God, would you um, continue to fill us up with your spirit now, Lord, as we, because we've sang songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, and your word says that as we sing those, you fill us up with your spirit. And I got a good feeling, Lord, that folks that came in here feeling a certain way already starting to feel a little different. God, we want to leave this place not the same the way that we came in. We want to leave um, having had an encounter with you. So, Lord, would you allow that to happen? Even now, as, as Ross preaches, would you fill him up with yourself, Lord, that he may um, share and teach and preach um, using the giftings that you've given him by way of your Holy Spirit today. God, we love you. We're so humbled that you allow us to be in this room to worship you together. Jesus, we pray all these things in your matchless name. We pray in Jesus' name. And the family said, amen. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. All righty. Good morning, church. Happy spring break. Uh, Hebrews 11.30 is where we will be. We're continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, if you're new, we've been walking through this ancient letter for quite a, quite a while, more than a year together. Um, it was written in the first century as a circular letter designed to be passed around, around small communities of Jewish believers who had put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and its primary purpose was to exhort and to encourage those believers to continue in their faith in spite of the many difficulties and obstacles they were facing. So that's what you hold in your hands today. If you've got your scriptures with you, this ancient letter um, written to a particular group of people encountering a particular set of problems. Um, uh, here at West, we've got kids in the room this morning, uh, grade school kids. I wanna say to you that, that though this will be long and boring and tiresome and will make you miss kids church like nothing else. I believe that you can take something from the message today. And so I want you to listen in. Maybe there's just one thing you wanna to repeat to your parents afterwards. Maybe there's just one question you're gonna have for them afterwards. It's gonna tell a story that some of you will know um, and that some of you won't know, but I believe in you guys and your intellectual and spiritual and emotional capacities uh, to be able to take the word of God and to learn um, as children, which we're all supposed to do. Over the last couple of months, here's what we've been doing. We've been focusing on a famous section of this letter that we've been devoting so much time to. It's found in chapter 11. It's commonly known as the Hall of Faith, right, which is a bit of a, an American play on words on Hall of Fame kind of stuff, right, that if you get someone who's especially good in their sporting career, they go on to a Hall of Fame, right, that it wasn't just enough to have their accolades during their career, they get remembered after their career as someone who stood out from amongst their peers, and so we've called it the, the Hall of the Faith, uh, uh, Hall of Faith, it's where the writer looks back at some famous stories of faith from the long story um, of God's people and his grace towards them, it's a helpful reminder to them and to us that we as people who are trying to live a faithful life in pursuit of God are not alone. That there are some who went before us who have had to endure things even more difficult and trying than anything that might beset us in our cultural moment. And yet they managed by faith to make it to the end intact. And so the writer's saying, hey, remember them. Hey, remember them. Hey, remember them. What they went through was harder than what you're going through. What they went through was more complicated than what you might endure. Remember them. They managed to make it to the end by faith. And so you too can make it to the end by faith. It's so helpful because we're obsessed, especially in our cultural moment, with our own uniqueness. Uh, it blinds us to the lessons that we can and should learn from others. We tend to think that our own challenges, our own opportunities, our own temptations, our own desires are unlike anything that has been experienced in any generation or place before, right? We're in an election cycle. How do they get people to turn out to vote? They say, this is the most important one ever, ever, right? And we all go, yes, it is, because our moment must be unique, right? It must be different to anything else that has come before. But that is an isolating 
an ignorant way of viewing the world and it's an isolating way of viewing God's people and their redemptive history that leaves us ultimately feeling alone and afraid and without possible guides and examples of what to do next. The writer of the epistle calls these readers to consider others. So before you face your own situation, consider others who have come long before you, who had also had to navigate the complexity of keeping faith in a complex world and then considering their lives and their examples of faith to take courage that they themselves could make it forward in faith with an assurance that they had hoped for and a conviction that they could not see. It's helpful sometimes to look back at previous generations and to see what they endured. I, I, I discipled my kids um, through a, a movie journey of education on Friday night, and we watched Back to the Future, um, the first one. Right? It's 40 years old. 40 years old! that movie, and it shows, wow. Um, but it was so fun to walk with our kids as they picked plot hole after plot hole, like why didn't they just call someone, right? And like, well, uh, here's what we had to endure, right, in our day. And, and, and here's what we had to look like, look at how people dressed, and yet we still made it to the end, right? And so it's helpful sometimes just to look back and realize, oh my goodness, history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it does rhyme and the besetting sin that has marked previous generations continues to mark this one, and so the obstacles of faith that they have, we have, though they may manifest in slightly different forms, right? The text this week turns to two different people. Two different people who lived at the same time in redemptive history and are part of the same significant event in the history of Israel. We easily could have made this two sermons, and as I was prepping this week, I was regretting that we didn't, in a way, right? I was going, oh, this is two sermons, we could spend so much time on each one of these, but actually I came to peace with it because I love the way their two stories juxtapose and tell us something really significant about God and faith in God from two different perspectives. Lest we fall into the trap of saying there's only one way for faith to kind of manifest, this story is two people in the same event but experiencing faith from very different perspectives and yet they both get mentioned in the hall of faith, right? Um, it shows us that faith not only comes from very different people but can manifest in very different ways. Here's the text, Hebrews 11, verse 30 and 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. So if you went to Sunday school, you know the story, right? Round the walls of Jericho, round the walls of Jericho, round the walls of Jericho, the armies went, right? And they walk around, they blow the trumpets and the walls fall down and the people are able to, uh, to, to take that city and to move into the land that they've been promised. By faith, in the midst of that, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Oh, the text points to a very important season and, and events in Israel's redemptive history. Let me just recap it for you, right? You can find them recorded in the first few chapters of Joshua if you wanna read them this afternoon. They're wonderful. What happens is that the people of Israel, with Joshua as their leader, after the death of Moses, they cross the Jordan and enter into what will be the land that God promised them, right? And so they've been wandering in the wilderness. They eventually make it there. What stands before them, though, is the incredibly intimidating fortified city of Jericho. From archeological and historical records that we understand it was the, 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 old, it's the oldest um, fortified city that we have on record from that region. It was unlike anything else. It looked impenetrable. And the Canaanites who inhabited Jericho were known as brutally strong and incredibly scary. And so the people send spies across the river, right? Um, and as they cross the river, they go, oh, there's only one problem, and it's Jericho. And so the land beyond there does look great, but Jericho looks terrifying, right? And so they need a plan and they need a lot of faith. And so Jacob sends, uh, sorry, uh, Joshua sends spies. They risk their lives in that very hostile city and it becomes known through gossip circles, there's nothing new under the sun, that they're there. Uh, they, and they get taken in by a prostitute and they were housed and protected in her home of ill repute. Her name was Rahab. And she made the spies swear that when Jericho was overthrown, that her family would be protected. She protected them at great risk to her life and then asked that they would protect her in return. You see, she had heard the talk. She had heard the rumors of the people of Israel. Probably, and this is so brutal, right? But probably through the travelers who frequented her business. 
told her the stories of the surrounding regions. Oh, there's this group of people, right? Um, there's this nation and they're approaching. And don't worry about the people, they're a ragamuffin group of nobodies, um, but they claim to be empowered by and protected by the one true God. And the stories that we've heard say that he is to be feared. She believed those stories and trusted that this God was true. And so she risks her life, she hides them, right, um, on her rooftop and made them promise to protect her when they inevitably overthrew the great city of Jericho, which she believed they would do by faith. They promised, they said, you have our word, but we'll only protect those who are in your house with you. And so now by faith, you're gonna need to go gather your family (laughs) and tell them that there's an army of nobodies coming who are just gonna sing and dance around the walls for a little while, but trust me, they're super scary and their God is the one true God and you have to stay in my house for seven days, right? That's by faith. Go tell your in-laws they have to come live with you for seven days. It takes immense faith, right? And so she calls them and says, you gotta gotta stay here, right? And, And they said, and only if you tie a, scar- a scarlet cord um, in your window marking the promise and your faith in God's protection, then you will be spared. The spies go back, they tell Joshua and all, all that they had seen and of the kindness that they received from Rahab. And Joshua says, all right, let's get to work. And he went to work as a military commander making a plan on how to attack Jericho. One evening, he's scoping the city out by himself. We're told that he's right there. He's near the walls under the cover of darkness and a messenger from the Lord stands before him. That's how the scripture describes him, a messenger from the Lord. Now, some say this is an angel. In fact, this messenger has been believed throughout church history to be a theophany, an appearance of God somehow manifest in time and space. Why would they say that this is the case? Why is he not just an angel? Well, because Joshua worships him. And Joshua calls him by the covenantal name of God. And if it was an angel, what do we know from the rest of scriptures? They say, don't do that, don't do that, right? I'm scary, God's scarier, right? That's that's normally their their line. Uh, This messenger just says, good, take off your shoes, right? Uh, Where you're standing, it's holy ground. So you have this manifestation of God himself before Joshua, right? And it's an amazing, and I love the interaction, which you can find in Joshua 5. Go go read it uh, today if you wanna be confused. Um, because it's amazing. Joshua asks this question, and I love it, is even as we think about um, our own society, our own culture, our own nation, if you're tempted to pray for a particular sports team um, and, and their outcome in March Madness, go read Joshua 5, because Joshua comes before the Lord and he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies, right? Great question. Will we win because we're your guys? Or will they win? Are they maybe your guys? Who are you for? What's going on, right? You know what the Lord answers? It's so disarming. Neither. Neither. But I've come as the commander of the Lord's army. Now take off your shoes. In other words, God is working on things that we have no idea about. And God exists in a way and works in a way that doesn't fit into our neat sets of desired outcomes. And so what you do in the midst of that is you worship him. (laughs) And you fall down before him and you say, okay, well then whatever outcome is whatever outcome. I thought I could put you in a neat category that says you're on this team. And God's like, I'm not on any of your teams. I'm God, worship me, worship me. I'm working on something that you cannot even Imagine, it's incredible. What happens next is that God gives Joshua the weirdest military strategy ever. And Joshua obeys. He tells him, I'm gonna give you the city. Here's how you're gonna take it. You're writing this down. You're gonna need some trumpets, right? And Joshua's like, well, that makes sense because no one can stand the sound um, of trumpets uh, on repeat, right? But that's what he tells them. You're You're gonna march around the city playing praise and worship music. Your priests are gonna carry the Ark of the Covenant. You're gonna take your priests, the weakest, most vulnerable members of your society militaristically, and you're gonna put the Ark of the Covenant right in the middle, and your army's gonna march around the city, um, around the walls of Jericho. You're gonna do it six days in a row. It's about a two hour march to get to the city, about 35 minutes to circle the walls, right? You're gonna do that six days in a row. You're gonna get your steps in, and then on the seventh day, you're gonna do it seven times. And then you're gonna shout and blow the trumpets and hey presto, Jericho is yours. Joshua, instead of going, "Um, that's not really how war works. Um, Could we have another option perhaps? Maybe while we're creating that distraction, I send my best fighting men and they get in another way, right? Joshua by faith obeys. And the people by faith obey. Imagine when Joshua has to tell his military commanders, okay guys, here's the plan. By faith they obey too. 
and the walls by faith, I love the way the scripture tells this, fall down. <laughs> and Rahab by faith has all her family hiding in her house with a single scarlet cord dangling out of the window and she spared. What a crazy story. But I love that God in his wisdom and mercy allows us to experience it both from Joshua and Rahab's perspective. I mean, could you get two more different people in terms of their stories and experiences, two more different people in terms of their perceived value and dignity and respect in society? You've got Joshua who's valiant and righteous, we're told, and holy and powerful and brave and respected and a military man of might and action. You've got Rahab, a pagan. A prostitute used and abused, extremely unlikely to be seen as valuable or respectable in the eyes of God's people or indeed in the eyes of her own people. And yet God uses both of them in the accomplishing of his purposes. And he uses the same mechanism in both of them, that of faith, though it manifests in such different ways. So let's just look at the different manifestations of faith that we see in Joshua from the story, just briefly, and then in Rahab from the story, and then let's ask ourselves how we might imitate their examples as we attempt to endure in lives of faith ourselves. Firstly, Joshua. Now, Joshua had faith to believe in God's miraculous power. He had faith to believe in God's miraculous power. Once he said yes to the Lord, what he's relying on from that moment on is a miracle. He's relying on God to intervene in a way that he couldn't possibly orchestrate that was outside the realm of human possibility. Uh, the, the faith that's d displayed through the life of Joshua is the faith that says that God has miraculous power, listen, and that he can use it in his world in whatever way he wants. Joshua says, hey, I've seen through the, the matrix here. I've seen the Lord, right? I've seen the messenger of the army. The world is therefore not a closed system to God. And so he can and does intervene in remarkable and miraculous ways when he wants to. And friends, make no mistake, the, the falling of the wall of Jericho is miraculous. I don't think it had to do with a particular note um, of the trumpet blast or that the walls were built without resistance to lots of shouting. Right, that in Jericho's architecture, they said, you know, the one thing that could take us down, lots of shouting, right? So as long as they don't figure that out, this thing's rock solid. No, I think they rock solid walls. I think it's a miraculous work of God. The writer to the Hebrews says that the walls fall by faith. Don't you love that personification? It's like the walls themselves go like, we've got no choice. And they themselves fall in worship, right? Um, as some kind of personified act of faith. But, but listen, we, we know that inanimate objects themselves don't have faith. So what is the faith that preempts God's miraculous hand that causes the walls to, to fall? It's the faith of Joshua. And it's the faith of the people of Israel. And listen, friends, it's undeniable. If you read the scriptures, God loves faith. He loves it. Uh, when his people respond in faith. And he loves responding to that faith in, in miraculous outworkings of his power. Now listen, when it comes to the miraculous, I really do see the people of God falling into one of two ditches. I see some people listening to that and they are hyped, right? For them, faith has two syllables. That's how you know when people got lots of faith because it's faith, right? You gotta, you gotta really hang in there, right? And that's, that's exciting for them. But what this does, listen friends, and we see this in theological moves in and amongst Christendom, is it seeks to make the miraculous normative, which then makes it cease to be miraculous, as if God operates this way all the time, right? No, no, he operates this way when he wants to, sometimes, quite seldom in the lives of the people of God. And, and we try to subject it uh, only to the strength of our faith, as if our faith has a causative effect and not a contributing one. So then when we don't see a miracle, we say, has to be lack of faith. Rather than saying the complex thing of like, no, no, God loves faith and he loves to respond to faith, but the response is still up to him. <laughs> he may respond in miraculous intervention and he may just respond by saying, I love your faith, thank you, right? And the answer to that is still no and the walls in our lives stay intact sometimes, right? That's the mystery of God. We can't make him beholden to have to come through in ways that he never actually promised he would. I see people go through suffering and sometimes I see well-meaning people of faith say, we're just believing in God for this. And I'm like, great, love it, God loves faith. 
And what if the outcome is something else? What does that say about God? And what does that say about your faith in this moment? If you wanna believe in God for something, believe in his goodness, believe in his power, ask him desperately for an outcome and then let him intervene in his world as he alone chooses in his wisdom and in his mercy. He may well move his miraculous hand and he may have a longer journey of waiting for you to walk through. You see, friends, here's why this matters. You go like, well, it's nitpicking. Why would you pick apart someone else's faith? It matters when suffering comes. And we see God sometimes in that suffering, not choosing to intervene miraculously in accordance with the way that that person's outcome had been set. He does a thousand other things in the moment. Brings miraculous evidence of community and support and, and, and love around people. So he's moving, he's acting, he's responding, but doesn't give the one outcome that we have nailed to the mast, right? He doesn't heal the person or overcome the problem in a supernatural way. When the outcome is the object of our faith, then those people end up despondent and either walking away from God, declaring that he's no good or not real, or bemoaning their own lack of spiritual vitality which has not resulted in the outcome that they desired because it was on them. And then they live with guilt and shame, which does what? Moves them away from the one true God um, who had the power to intervene in the first. That's why it matters. That's why it matters. Now listen, <laughs> here in Austin, before we get all super excited in our comfy Baptist chairs, right? The second ditch is as dangerous. In the second ditch, we yield to our modernist sensibilities and essentially reduce God's will to a closed system where he can't intervene miraculously. We read stories like this one, we go like, yeah, that was cool. He, doesn't, he, he really doesn't do that anymore. And we don't say it out loud in our church circles, but we feel it in our prayers. We keep making excuses for God. You're probably not gonna do this. He probably won't intervene. Um, you, me, and really what we believe is, I don't think he can anymore or that he will. We dress it all up in some form of rationalistic theological system, but we end up reducing the power of God to do whatever he wants with his world, which is part of what makes him God. <laughs> and we ignore all of the passages that speak of how much God loves it when his people believe him for the impossible. And so friends, can we just dwell in the tension as people of faith? God can do whatever he wants in the world and he loves for us to have faith but our faith doesn't hold him to a particular response because he, he remains the freest of all agents in the cosmos. He's free to do whatever he wants with what he made. Our response is one of faith and trusting him with the outcomes. To be a Christian and to believe the witness of scripture is to believe that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He does with it what he pleases and when he pleases. Our job is to respond in faith. Look quickly at some of the ways that Joshua displayed this sort of faith. Firstly, he had faith to obey God's word even if he looked foolish. He had faith to obey God's word even if he looked foolish. This strategy made no sense. Uh, I've said already, but can you imagine the meeting when Joshua gets his commanders together? He, <laughs> they must have thought he'd lost his mind. Right? Can you imagine when they then have to go explain to the people? Okay, don't worry about your swords, just get up, bring your trumpet, right? Yes, your trumpet, um, and come march around the walls with us. They were like, a trumpet? Like, this is not a good weapon, right? Um, but this is the one that you need. Can you imagine, listen, the taunts that were yelled down from the walls of Jericho? They're within earshot, they're within visibility. Can you imagine the people of Jericho yelling from the walls? Can you imagine how tired of that the people must have been by day five? But Joshua obeyed by faith and Israel obeyed, he kept doing it. Can you imagine after day one, they're like, well, that did nothing. Day two, still nothing. By day five, you're like, Joshua, so just describe this vision of God to me again. Well, are you sure, are you sure, right? because you keep doing the same little act of faith and it doesn't seem to be yielding any result. Are, are we sure? No, by faith they keep going in spite of the apparent folly because they believe that God has spoken. Friends, I've realized afresh, goodness me, God keeps reminding me of this lesson. I've realized afresh uh, a little bit that, uh, over the last little bit, that if I follow God faithfully, I'll be seen as a fool by the world. And if I'm honest, being seen as foolish is probably my number one fear. 
It's led me to a lifelong cycle of non-joining, right? That's why I still don't dance, because I'm just like, I oh, think I'll look foolish. They're having fun, but I won't look like that. I'll look like a fool, right? And so anything I'm not gonna be super good at or respected for, I'm very loath to participate in because looking like a fool, number one fear, right? To be a follower of Christ, faithfully obeying the scriptures, you're gonna have to look like a fool in the eyes of some people. Obedience takes faith. Faith that God's love will be enough to cover the folly of the world. I love what R. Kent Hughes said. He said, the scriptures reveal a spiritual law. Disobedience reveals our unbelief, but obedience to God evidences our faith. So we obey him by faith. When difficult circumstances assail us, unbelief draws from the arsenals of the world, whereas faith causes us to take up the armor of God and to join the absurd march around Jericho. Any Jerichos facing you, he asks, are you wavering between God's way and the world's way of meeting it? Do you believe God's word? The authenticity of your belief will be determined by the weapon that you choose. How are you fighting for your faith? With the way of the world or with the way of God's word? He says it's better to give than to receive. How do we fight back against the world's weapons of greed? He says that, that repentance is, is a joy and that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance and so you should run to it freely and frequently and openly. How do we fight back against our own sin? In secrecy, in hiding, in deceit, or in using the weapons that, that, that the scriptures have given us? He says that the meek will inherit the earth. How are we currently trying to inherit the earth? Through meekness? or through the same powers that the world's used to dominate and subjugate and lift ourselves up over others. All right, second thing. Joshua had faith to lay down his own power and strength and control. Joshua was a brilliant fighter. I don't identify with this at all because I don't like fighting. I've never been very good at it. I was a hit and run kind of expert um, and so dependent on my speed for a rapid getaway, right? So uh, willing to throw a punch but not willing to kind of get into the cut and thrust of a, uh, of a hand-to-hand combat. Um, but, but Joshua wasn't like this. He was fearless. He was strong. But this strategy, not just looking foolish, this strategy involved something that wasn't typical or normal for him. It involved being weak and vulnerable and exposed, letting them keep the high ground and taunt you for days and days. This was the opposite of good military strategy. So many of us, friends, think that we need faith to be strong and yet don't realize you're gonna need the most faith to be weak, (laughs) to be vulnerable, to be seen as you really are. It's too risky and so many of us don't actually engage in that faith exercise. But the only times that we really get to see God come through as big in our lives is when we are prepared to be small. Paul reminded us that the strength of God and the sufficiency of his grace is only made apparent when we're prepared to be known and seen and exposed as weak. And yet, you talk of number one fears, that might be the number one fear of our society, being seen as weak. And it's the way forward to life, by faith. Thirdly, Joshua has faith in the power an object of worship. What gave Joshua the certainty? Nothing short of an encounter with the living God. And this encounter through face down worship allows him to place the worship of God right in the center of the onslaught of Jericho. They put the ark in the middle, showing the world that where the presence of the Lord is is the only place they truly wanna be. We sing the song often, right? If you're not here, I don't wanna be, right? I've always found it a strange line because I'm like, but God's omnipresent and so he's everywhere. But, but, but I think the line is saying, right, uh, uh, unless we have the presence of God, we don't have anything of value. And that's what Joshua is modeling for us as well. He's like, I won't march around without the ark in the middle, showing that the presence of God is our ultimate security. So friends, if that's true, if the presence of God is the ultimate reality in the world, and the ultimate thing that's gonna endure us and protect us and give us victory, then are you prioritizing your encounters with God so that his presence in your life is a reality? Is his presence in the center of how you plan to fight back against the principalities and powers for your life? I know that some of you have great plans to fight back. Praise the Lord, right? If it doesn't have the presence of God in the center, 
then it's probably something formed and forged in the patterns of the world. It would make no sense for Joshua to expose the one thing that was most vulnerable in their midst, the ark and the priests. But he does it because with it, he shows that he had the miraculous um, encounter with God and that his presence is the most powerful thing on the planet. Friends, do you love God's presence? Why do you come to church on Sunday mornings? And, and, and how do you ready yourself for worship, corporate worship together? Is it centered on, I just want the Lord's presence. I just want Him. I just want to hear Him, know Him, be empowered by Him. Or does it continue to be centered and shaped by our preferences, our styles, our comfort? In your own life, that what are the bookends of your day? Are they marked by the presence of the Lord? Or by the presence of everybody else? The urgency of the world all the time? Or is it marked with, no, no, Lord, unless you're here, I've got no chance. Unless you're in the middle, I don't stand a chance. All right, that's the faith of Joshua. What about the faith of Rahab? This lady's incredible, right? Joshua had this big miracle working faith of a prominent man. What about Rahab? Well, Rahab had faith to believe in God's redemptive retelling of her story (laughs) from a totally different position with a totally different posture, but the same faith. Friends, I don't wanna at all trivialize Rahab's story or diminish her agency, right? And I also don't wanna get into it too much with kids in the room, but it's tough to ignore what we know historically about the life that she must have lived in the, uh, in the career, uh, if you can call it such, that she was in, in the Bronze Age region of history and space in which she inhabited. She would most likely have been exposed to treatment that was shameful, violent, diminishing, and dehumanizing again and again and again and again. Now here's where the providence of God is so mysterious. I've asked him afresh this week. I don't know why God doesn't intervene sooner in her story. (laughs) I don't know how the mechanics of his sovereignty all work. I don't know if she could have perhaps been spared some of that pain and some of that shame. Here's what I do know, God didn't waste it. (laughs) He used the circumstances of her life, even the really tough ones for redemptive purposes and the telling of a magnificent story of grace that we still get to benefit from today. Uh, Just consider consider with me some of the ways that Rahab serves as an exemplar of faithful living. Firstly, Rahab had faith to believe what she heard about God. What she heard about God. When the spies come, she says, oh no, I've heard. I've heard. Look at at the story quickly in Joshua 2. I don't have a lot of time, but look at this. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now, does she have any evidence of that? No, right? They're stuck at this point on the other side of the Jordan with no easy way to cross and then certainly no way to get past Jericho. But she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. She's declaring the secrets that other people feel by the conviction of the common grace of the Holy Spirit trying to win them to obedience, but she's the only one who believes. And that all of the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. They've all heard the story. She hears the story and says, I believe that to be true. I believe that to be true. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites and who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Why? For the, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She says, he is your God. She still doesn't even think there's any possibility of redemption in which the Lord their God might be her God. He's their God, and yet she still believes. And yet she still believes, isn't even confident she can get anything from this God, and still believes in who he is. Rahab didn't have access to any theological education or training. She didn't do ASDP, right? Or certainly wouldn't have made it to the end. She grew up with no eyewitness account for herself of God's power, and she was surrounded by people who didn't believe it, but she says, the Lord your God, he is God. He is God in the heavens and on the earth beneath. Friends, not many of us will get Joshua type evidence of God's power. 
Will we have faith to hear the stories of his power and might and goodness and believe in them even though we don't see a lot of the miraculous outworkings we crave in the midst of our everyday lives? Romans 10 tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, right? We have to go, okay, well, I've heard the word of Christ. I've read this and and there's no one like him. That's enough for me to believe that this God, this God is the God of the heavens and of the earth. Rahab hears, she doesn't even see, she hears. And she has faith to believe what she hears. Secondly, Rahab had faith to play her part in God's larger story. (laughs) Her faith wasn't conceptual and just remained there. She didn't just say, oh, I believe and what am I gonna change? Absolutely nothing. She said, no, I believe and that's gonna have some implications for me. She put into practice when when, when she gets the providential opportunity to then, uh, to obey God, she does that. It's amazing how she's remembered in scripture. James in his epistle, when he's making a huge point about how real faith is evidenced by works, he uses two examples. One of them is Abraham, the other is Rahab. (laughs) He says, oh, you wanna see a real faith? A faith that really does something? A faith that takes risks? A faith that submits its whole life? Well, consider with me Abraham and then consider with me Rahab. (laughs) He says that she received the spies and sent them out in safety and in so doing, look how James describes this, received the justification that was due for her faith. There is a salvific act in this moment because her faith grows legs and she's able to say, this is the one true God, I need to be rescued by him and so I'll lay down my whole life before him. And guess what he does? He rescues her in that moment in accordance with the scriptures. What a weird way to come to faith. She didn't put up her hand in a service, certainly not while every eye was closed. This was public risk. And she takes it by faith and God sees her and meets her and saves her. Here's what I love about that. Rahab didn't wait until her circumstances changed. She didn't bemoan her lot in life. She didn't make a deal with God that she would honor him when uh, when given what she wanted, which was surely a different kind of life than the one that she had. No, she grabbed hold of the opportunity she had to display faith at great risk to herself and she obeyed God right where she was in the midst of her brokenness. Friends, if Rahab is not too unlikely an agent of God's redemptive plan in the world through faith, then you aren't either. (laughs) You aren't either. Many of us feel anonymous, many of us feel overlooked or ashamed or forgotten by God and his people or used and abused by others or lacking in leadership or theological knowledge or influence or recognition in society. What does it look like for you to put your faith into action where you are right now? What would it look like for you to connect your story as small or as strange as it might be to God's greatest story of redemption. What's your part to play by faith? Play it, play it, obey him. Lastly with Rahab, (laughs) she had faith to submit patiently to the redemptive plan of God. (sighs) The story of Rahab is stunning. Look with me at Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, Matthew chapter one. She's going all the way back, trying to show the lineage of King David and then walks all the way through King David's lineage all the way to Jesus. But when telling the story of David, look at how Matthew tells it. He says, Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. Right, you have to say it like that because salmon sounds weird. Um, And Salmon, the father of Boaz. Now suddenly, we get another gender appearing in the mix by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, it happens again through another unlikely woman introduced into the story by Ruth. And Obed, the father, and Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. Um, friends, <laughs> Rahab's name is etched into the redemptive bloodline of Jesus right there, four generations from King David. A Canaanite prostitute. <laughs> oh, what grace. What grace, but it gets even greater, friends. Just genealogies are some of the best parts of the Bible if you can do the work, right? Rahab, we're told, uh, uh, married uh, uh, Salmon, 
right? And Salmon was the son of Nashon. Now we all know what that means, right? Because number 712, which is many of your theme verses for life, tells us that Nashon was a prince in Judah. Rahab didn't just get spared, she didn't just get rescued, she went on to have her story redeemed. She ends up, this woman of ill repute, marrying into Israeli royalty in the tribe of Judah and was the great, great grandmother of King David and a very proudly pronounced part of the bloodline of our King Jesus. Now listen, she had to wait a long time. She had to endure a lot of things. But what the enemy of God intended for evil, God used for good. I believe we looked at this verse a couple of weeks ago, right? And for the saving of many lives. The scarlet thread that hung from her window went on to be a marvelous picture of God's work of redemption in action across millennia. A picture that showed that no one No one is too far removed for the grace of God if they'll just grab hold of that thread by faith. That our past don't have to dictate our futures and that God loves to use the most unlikely of people to be the tellers of his great story of redemption. Oh my goodness, I love the scriptures. There's hope for a nobody like me. There's hope for people like us. Some of you friends, today will feel a call like Joshua. I don't say that lightly. When I look around this room and around the, the rooms in our city under which, you know, in which our church gathers, I see so much human potential, seriously, so much leadership, so much gifting, so much resource. And so some of you need a little faith wake up call like a Joshua today because God has gifted you and empowered you and equipped you and resourced you and given you influence. Great, brilliant, don't Waste it, don't waste it. You will need to manifest your faith in humble obedience, in weakness, in doing things God's way in a world that will find that foolish. And you need to do that again and again and again and again until you see his hand move. Friends, if you're seeking some kind of like dignified secrecy in and amongst the people of God, the people of God have always existed as a parade of fools. Join the parade. Don't stand aside. Don't waste your gifts. Don't waste your influence. Submit them by faith to the wisdom of God and do it again and again and again and again. Some of you today might identify with the unlikeliness of a Rahab. Maybe your story is not as traumatic, but you feel overlooked like she was overlooked, right? Maybe your story does have some of that in and you feel disqualified. You feel too far from God and from his people. You, you might feel like as you look at the circumstances of your life, you, you, you might feel like it hasn't turned out the way that you had hoped and you're waiting for God to unlock some circumstances and then you'll follow him fervently. No, friends, you get to manifest faith today in quiet obedience, in patience, and in resilience. It matters. It matters. The people of God have always been made up of heroes who are too unlikely to be drafted into any other story. And so come play your part, as small as it may seem. You see, that scarlet cord that hung from a prostitute's window was the story of God saving his people through his grace and power and through the blood of his son. By faith, today, we too can have our stories grafted into his story of redemption by letting that same cord weave through our lives, connecting us to the way of God's salvation, which is the spilled blood and the merciful love of his son, Jesus Christ, who came from the line of Rahab. And so now we, like fools, standing outside of Jericho, what do we do now? We get to sing in our rebellious march of praise with God's presence among us, stirring us, empowering us. And the scarlet cord of God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ, securing all of us in our certain and sure rescue and bonding and tying us all together in this grand story of grace. Welcome to the parade of fools. Father God, thank you so much for your word. (laughs) 
Lord, it's not how we would tell it. Um, and I'm so grateful that you tell it another way. And so Lord, I'll ask today for a supernatural outpouring of the gift of faith into our midst. And I pray that we would respond to that with even more faith. That now as we sing and as we worship, we would center you and your presence in our lives like nothing else. And that would be the pattern of our faith going forward from this day. Lord, I pray for those in this room, perhaps like Joshua, much to offer. I pray that they would submit themselves to the foolishness of God and to, and to the way that you tell us to live our lives, which is gonna look the opposite of what it looks like to live successfully in the world. By faith, let them submit. By faith, let them see you do miraculous things. Lord, I pray for those in this room, the unlikely, the overlooked, the ill-treated, the oft-forgotten. I pray that in the story of Rahab, we would see that scarlet thread. <laughs> and today we might just wrap it around our hands and take hold of it and that we'd never let go. That by faith we would say, well, my story, as unlikely as it is, matters in this big story and I'm willing to play my part. May we send to you, may we trust in you, may we worship you, may we live for you by faith and by faith alone. In Jesus' name. Amen, family. So now we get to respond by singing to the same God. Let's stand together. We sing to the same God that showed grace to Rahab and gave power. Let's sing about him. Come on. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations
You are here. 
appreciate your working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working
We might just have church in here. As we move towards a time of uh, closing the service, we don't want to do so without um, a worshipful time with our tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask our ushers to come on down to take that this morning by faith. What a more simple and fundamental way to practice and grow our faith than by prioritizing those things that are important in our life and putting God first. But Deuteronomy reminds us the reason tithes and offerings and giving was introduced into the biblical narrative was to remind us to prioritize and put God first. And this is a great practice of our faith this morning. So let me encourage you to consider that as you think about giving this morning. A couple of things that we want you guys to know about. Going on in the life of the church over the next couple of weeks, we've got Easter coming up. Folks, it's just a few weeks away. Um, this has been a really, really quick spring, right? Um, congratulations on making it here this morning with the time change. Uh, but Easter's coming. We've got services on Easter Sunday at 7, 9, 11, and 1. And after that, 1 o'clock, we're going to have a baptism service, and we're really excited about that. And so if you are interested in being baptized on Easter Sunday, and if you profess Christ as your Savior, and you want to follow him in believer's baptism, we want to talk to you about that. We've got a baptism class over the next couple of weeks, or I will personally sit down with you and and walk you through what that looks like. But what a beautiful way to celebrate Easter. The life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, then proclaiming our identity in him on that Easter Sunday. So let me encourage you to consider that. Today, if you're wanting to connect, one, there's a connect card. I would encourage you, whether you Um, have been here for a long time, or this is your first Sunday here, to fill this out, put a prayer request on there. We want to connect with you. We want to pray for you this week. We've also got a discovery class after this service this morning up in the equipping room upstairs. And if you just want to connect with our church and find out what's going on in the life of our people, meet some staff members, um, we would encourage you to come right after this service upstairs and find out a little bit more about our church. Also, the Easter weekend um, I forgot, and I don't want to want to miss this as well. On Good Friday, we have services at 4 and 6 right here, and we want to encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to close with a benediction today, and I want you guys to stand and join me. We're going to read this together. 
Um, it's from the message um, this morning. Would you guys join me, church family, as we read this together as we close? May we go in the same grace that marked the life of Rahab. May we go in the same power that accompanied the faith of Joshua. And may our lives tell the story of God's unfailing love. And may the scarlet cord of Christ's mercy continue to bind us all together. Amen. If you'd like to talk to someone or pray, we'll be down here at the front. You guys have a great week.